Now, why is it so hard uh, for the United States to buy in to a realist theory of the world and a realist explanation of its own behavior? Well, uh, realism has two real problems with it for most Americans. First of all, realism has a very pessimistic view of international politics. It says there has always been conflict, uh, there is conflict today, and there always will be conflict, and there's not much you can do about it. This is what I call the tragedy of great power politics, which is the title of my book. The second point that realists make that most Americans uh, find repugnant is the idea that you can't discriminate between morally virtuous states and malign states in the international system. For realists, all states are basically black boxes that behave the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, if the United States has to be ruthless, the United States will have to be ruthless. That's the argument that realists make. Now, Americans are fundamentally liberals at heart. They believe in progress. They're products of the Enlightenment. They're people who believe that through hard thinking and skillful policies, it's possible to solve the world's problems. That somewhere out there in the future, it's hard to say where, we can create a more peaceful world. That is in contrast to the pessimism of realists. And American liberals, and when we talk about American liberals, we're talking about the vast majority of Americans, therefore dislike realism for that reason. The other point that Americans believe in is the idea that our country, the United States, is a highly moral country. We behave according to a different code of conduct than most, uh, most other states. In the Cold War, for example, there were good guys and bad guys. We were the good guys, and the Soviets were the bad guys. Realists, on the other hand, don't discriminate between good states and bad states. They're just states. And a realist explanation of the Cold War would say that the United States and the Soviet Union were both equals, and they behaved according to the same rules, because the structure of the system left them with no choice. That's perspective that most Americans recoil at. Now, in, in addition to this uh, uh, dilemma for Americans to understand uh, the way the world really works and, and the way that policymakers actually make policy, uh, th there is the added difficulty that we're doing this in a democracy, right? So it, 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 your theory and what you just said suggests that our leaders are always not putting all their cards on the table as they get elected and debate the issues. And, and w how does that problem affect the way we behave in the world? Well, we behave in the world according to realist dictates on almost every occasion, right? Mm -hmm. What's affected by the point you're making is our rhetoric, yeah. right? In other words, we act according to the dictates of real politique, but we justify our policies in terms of liberal ideologies, mm -hmm. right? So what is going on here is that in many cases, elites speak one language, right, and act according to a different logic and speak a different language behind closed doors. Now to unpack this a bit more, there are some cases where the dictates of realpolitik and the dictates of the idealism that is so attractive to most Americans line up perfectly. For example, in the fight against Nazi Germany and the fight against the Soviet Union, the logic of realism pointed in exactly the same direction as the logic of idealism. So it was not difficult for American elites to justify the war against both Nazi Germany and against Soviet Union in terms of idealist rhetoric, and it was completely consistent with what we were doing. The really tricky cases are when the United States has to form an alliance with a repressive regime, right, or go to, against a, go to war against a state that it thinks is quite progressive, and then realist logic points in one direction and idealist logic points in another direction. And in those cases, what the United States does is it brings out the spin doctors and they tell a story to the American people that makes it look like what the United States is doing is completely consistent with its ideals. A perfect case in point of this is how we dealt with the Soviet Union in the late 1930s. Uh, in the late 1930s, Stalin was viewed as a murderous thug, and the Soviet Union was widely considered to be a totalitarian state. But in December of 1941, when we went to war against Nazi Germany, we ended up as a close ally of the Soviet Union. So what we did was bring the spin doctors out, and Joseph Stalin became Uncle Joe, uh, and the Soviet Union was described as an emerging democracy, and we made all the necessary rhetorical changes to make it look like we were aligning ourselves with a burgeoning democracy, because Americans would find it very difficult to tolerate a situation where we, in effect, jumped into bed uh, with a totalitarian state that was run by a, a murderous leader like Joe Stalin. So we cleaned them up.
So what, what is the implications of this for the notion that we try to uh, uh, conduct our foreign policy in a democratic system? Because on the one hand, I'm hearing you say that uh, our politicians do not lay all their cards on the table. But then on the other hand, uh, uh, they are uh, acting in ways that they cloak what really is governing their action uh, in, in liberal uh, uh, democratic terms. I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, how should people examine their leaders in an electoral process, in a democracy, when it comes to the conduct of foreign policy? Well, I think that they should tend to be very skeptical to begin with. I think it's very important for uh, students uh, of foreign policy uh, to be skeptical about what their leaders say, regardless of the country that you live in, regardless of whether it's Bill Clinton or George Bush, who's running American foreign policy. We should all be very skeptical uh, of what our leaders say, because they have powerful incentives to mislead us on occasion. Not always. As I said before, there'll be cases where uh, they're giving us the straight poop, but there'll be cases where they have an incentive to uh, mislead, and we want to be aware of that. Uh, Second point is, I would pay more attention to what states do rather than what they say. Uh, and I think if you look at the behavior of states and mesh it with the rhetoric of the leaders, you'll often find a real disjuncture there. And those are the cases where you want to examine things much more closely.